Good afternoon, everyone. It's Myron Brilliant, the Executive Vice President of the U.S. Chamber in charge of international affairs. Delighted to have all of you attending today's very exciting uh, program on national security, Americans' competitiveness, and U.S. global engagement, uh, our latest uh, virtual in-step forum. I want to just thank everyone for the great turnout and for, uh, I think, a very timely discussion. Uh, obviously, Secretary uh, Defense Austin's trip to Asia last month brought into the I think the prism of a very important conversation about the role of the United States going forward about U.S. engagement in the Indo-Pacific arena. As always, uh, we try to make these a public on the record uh, discussion and today's will be that. So we are recording the session for distribution. If you have questions, I want to remind you, if you have questions for our speakers today, please put them in the chat box and we'll make every effort to get to them before the end of the session. In fact, our moderator today has made that a promise. So please uh, do add your questions into the chat room. We're gonna do things a little bit differently tonight. Uh, I'm not in my usual jacket. I'm actually getting a vaccine shot uh, later today. But what I'm gonna tell you is uh, we have a great moderator. I'm gonna step back from that traditional role uh, and I'm thankful to do that because we have David Ignatius from the Washington Post who will lead today's discussion with our guest speaker. And before I turn it over to David, let me just introduce both David and uh, Dr. Ash Carter briefly. Uh, and I think neither really need an extensive uh, introduction, but I'm reminded of that uh, moment where Kissinger was being introduced by someone who said, I don't have to introduce Secretary Kissinger. Everyone knows who he is. And what did Kissinger say when he got to the podium? He said, I might not have needed an introduction, but I certainly would have welcomed one. So today, let me do the honor of introducing Dr. Ash Carter, who is obviously the former Secretary of Defense and the current director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also an innovation fellow and corporation member at MIT, covering two of our finest institutions uh, Ash, you'll have to explain how you do that. But his background is with another fine institution. Uh, he has quite a unique background. At Yale, he uh, trolled the dusty archives of manuscripts for his major in medieval history. Maybe he ran into my father, a famous uh, Greek and Roman art historian who was at Yale. But anyway, immersed himself in the clean and modern logical and mathematical language of physics to write his thesis on quirks. So, David, you might want to ask him what that means in English, but uh, he also earned uh, a doctorate in physics at Oxford. So needless to say, he's been well educated. Ash became the 25th uh, Secretary of Defense after serving as both CEO and weapons czar at the Pentagon. He has served presidents of both parties with distinction. We thank him for his three decades of service and has really leveraged his expertise in national security technology and innovation in both the public and private sectors. In so doing, I think he's played a very instrumental and, contri and really contributed to a more secure and prosperous world, although these are very dangerous times, and I'm sure David will get into that in his conversation. But he's the right person for this conversation today on national security and American competitiveness as we look at advanced technologies and the deployment of U.S. power in non-traditional areas like climate and disaster recovery. So we're very pleased, Ash, for you to join us today. Of course, uh, he's going to be probed by someone who I think also needs no lengthy introduction, but is one of our finest journalists uh, in a generation. David Ignatius, of course, the esteemed journalist at The Washington Post, who has written extensively on foreign policy and national security. If you wake up in the morning to the morning shows, you see his face often talking about the issues of the day. David really has covered everything from the risk of unequal economic recovery to projection of U.S. force abroad to the Biden administration's work to create an alliance of techno democracies. We're going to have to see how that goes uh, that can prevent perhaps Chinese domination of global technology. He's also an accomplished novelist, someone also very skilled in multiple ways written 11 spy novels. I have to say I've read, read at least one of them, and they're quite good, and I'll mention that one, The Quantum Spy. Uh, this isn't the first time David has done an in-step session, and it's maybe the first time he's done it virtually, but he's been on previous ones. 
But it's also not the first time that he's introduced uh, the former Secretary of Defense, interviewed him previously. So we're looking very much to this conversation. And David, uh, there's a lot of ground to cover, and I'm going to turn it over to you to start the conversation. Thank you very much, the two of you. David, you're muted. Forgive me for being muted initially. I want to thank Myron for his nice introduction uh, and say how pleased I am to uh, host this conversation with Ash Carter, who is uh, an extraordinary uh, leader in, in national security policy. I have been uh, talking to him about uh, defense issues. Uh, I want to say learning from him now for, for decades. I should also mention that in his current role as director of the Belfer Center, I uh, have a tiny role as a senior fellow of the Future of Diplomacy uh, project at the Belfer Center. So I feel uh, in a, at least a small way, I'm a, a colleague of, of, of Ash's. Um, Ash, uh, welcome uh, to our conversation. And, and with your permission, I'll, I'll jump right in. Sure, sure. Good to be here with you, as always with you. And Myron, thank you for having me. So, uh, Ash, let me begin with uh, the new administration. Uh, Joe Biden has, has been our, our president now for four months almost. Um, I'm very interested in, in how you think he's doing. Uh, and uh, since I, I, I know you'll have a lot of nice things to say about him, I'm going to phrase the question a little bit a little bit differently by asking you what you think he should be doing more of uh, as he lays out foreign uh, defense national security policies and what perhaps he should be doing less of. Well, let me start with the more of part. I mean, first of all, I do know him. I've known him for a long time. I served under him and it's, uh, you know, he's a very deliberative uh, guy, which is welcome. Uh, he's a very decent, wholly rounded human being, which is welcome. Uh, and so I, that is uh, pleasant and uh, refreshing. Um, I think what he'll be doing less of, at least I hope, uh, is the startup stuff that was necessary when you take the reins in an adverse time. Uh, and that's not a comment on a previous administration. It's a comment principally on COVID in the state of the economy. And, you know, of necessity, he's had to focus on that. Uh, and, you know, what that means is that other things inevitably are going to have to wait. Now, he's got really, really good people working for him, which we're all lucky to have. Um, something that won't wait, David, if that gets at the heart of your question, um, is, are things like Afghanistan and Syria. And the reason they won't wait is that we are in both of those, which I have a history in and we, we can talk about more, but um, we are at the moment inadvertently on a backslide in both of those places because we're not, we're, we haven't been decisive as a country in what our approach is. Let me take Afghanistan. I mean, Afghanistan, uh, geez, we have, you know, I worked on Afghanistan for a lot of years and a lot of positions in the Defense Department, and I know people are sick of it and all that, but I think there's an upside to prevailing there, where prevailing is 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 not defined as being there fighting forever. It is defi defined as being there uh, for a long time. But but you know when you tell your enemy that you're going to leave on a date certain, and you tell your enemy your friends that you're talking with your enemy and their enemy, um, you've, ingredient, you've, you, you've added a huge psychological battlefield disadvantage uh, to yourself. And I, it's a complicated decision. I understand that the president has, has a lot of uh, 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 very well-informed but longstanding 
a fuse and he'll want to see how things are going today and so but the, these things don't wait because some things you can put on a shelf that one you can't put on a shelf with every day you're losing ground in my opinion and what what nobody can want is needlessly lost ground after all we've put in there now it's not you know i'm not talking about throwing good money after bad i am talking about um you know not losing uh, uh, something you've won uh, or could win uh, by inadvertent. So I hope he's able to get to those. Say, I mean, I understand that COVID and the economy and and dealing with domestic political settle the ball down, let's stop yelling at each other stuff, uh, which he does so well, is is top priority. But we we got to get around to some of these things that are that are festering and that are headed in the wrong direction unless in in the absence of a decision. So, uh, Ash, let's look a little uh, uh, more care, uh, closely at, at Afghanistan. There is a May 1 deadline that was nego negotiated by Zalmay Khalilzad, the special envoy for President Trump, for the withdrawal of the remaining U.S. troops in Afghanistan. It, it's supposed to be 2,500. Uh, recent reports suggest it's closer to 3,500, but it's not a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and, and when uh, uh, President Biden was asked about that deadline, he said a couple of interesting things. He said, we're probably going to miss it it's so close. It's hard to get all the people and equipment out in an orderly fashion. But he made clear that he intends to get out. And when a journalist at his press conference pressed him and said, uh, Mr. President, can you imagine American troops being in Afghanistan uh, next year? He said, I can't imagine that, which I thought came, uh, in my mind, perilously close to setting that fixed departure date. We won't be there next year. So uh, Taliban uh, leaders, you know, bring it on is, is the fear that that's how they how they read it. So I want to ask you to, to, given the reality of what President Biden has told us, he wants out and he's getting out. What do you think we can do to protect our national security interests in an Afghanistan that's going to look more chaotic as the Taliban try to uh, consolidate what they think is a victory and the government of, of Ashraf Ghani in Kabul tries desperately to hold on? How are we going to cope with that? Uh, that is the question. And um, it, it, I, I think the answer to that question, David, is a, a, a trying to retain a lasting opportunity in Afghanistan to make sure it stays reasonably peaceful and that we can operate out of there. Now, that's different from having a combat troop presence. And so I, 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 I take President Biden at his word. Um, listen, I got to tell you, I, you know, all those years in Afghanistan, I was talking about my wife and I would be in the hospital every week in the hospitals every weekend. And once I was in Landstuhl when I was, I think, under Secretary of Defense and visiting folks because that was a transit site from Afghanistan back to Walter Reed. And who unexpectedly shows up? Joe Biden, then Vice President Joe Biden. So this is a guy who, who, who's, who, who, who knows what it's like to give orders as a commander in chief. Um, and I don't think he wants Americans fighting in Afghanistan. And I get that. I don't think that's necessary, David, I guess. Uh, but I do want to, in a dangerous part of the world, have a friendly government, friendly to the United States, and one that allows us to operate with them when we have threats that require that. Don't forget, David, we could never have gotten to Abbottabad without Jalalabad. There's no way, no, I can just tell you, you know, having seen lots and lots of raids and missions and planned, you know, being involved in the planning of them over the, over the years, there's no way we could have gotten from the ocean to Abbottabad. And, Bin Laden's still been pacing in his compound. So I don't think we're talking about a combat presence. I think we are talking about an American presence. And in order to make that possible, you have to make your exit 
smooth and understood. And I think that's what he's aiming for. At least that's what I infer. I can't speak for him. So if, if I understand you, you're saying from our counterterrorism interests standpoint, some residual presence that allows us to pursue uh, reconsolidated Al Qaeda safe havens or or a more a more toxic version of ISIS is necessary. Let me ask you Maybe without access and not presence, but either way. So access to 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 Bagram, the, you, we're getting to the to the sort of fundamental question I have, which is. Is it realistic to think that we'd have the uh, intelligence, the essential platforms necessary to know what the heck's going on in, in an Afghanistan post-American uh, 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 withdrawal um, with such a small presence? How are we going to know what's happening? Well, I think that I think if we have and a government of Afghanistan that is cooperative. And remember, that's been the objective the whole time. If we end up with a, a, a government that's all Taliban and that is like the old Taliban that tolerated bin Laden, then it'll be a lot harder from the outside looking in to know when we're in trouble. Uh, and so it's much, much, that's the reason not to abandon people that we have worked with. Uh, but to try to make them part of a future uh, with us. I think that kind of future is attainable. That's not fighting forever, it, it, but it is being there in the sense of having a government that you can deal with uh, there. You know, look, just take a look at the globe, David. It's a dangerous part of the world. Ain't a bad thing to have a uh, friendly uh, country in that area. That's good for American security. And fortunately, uh, I think that view is shared by all of the neighbors, including Russia, China, India, and Pakistan, that a, a, a splintering, imploding Afghanistan isn't in any of their interests. Let me ask you uh, to turn to another uh, problem area, which uh, President Biden personally and the administration are struggling with, uh, and that's Russia. You have been a kind of Cassandra about the rising threat of Russian power uh, when you were at the Pentagon. Uh, and I want to ask you um, uh, what kind of advice you would give to the new administration. Uh, I'll, I'll sharpen that by asking you to, to think a little bit about the recent Russian movements uh, just east of the Ukraine border, um, which the Russians are claiming are military exercises, but I, I know people on the NSC and uh, Pentagon and state are seriously worried about. How do we back up uh, Putin in this instance and more generally? Um, well, uh, Vladimir Putin, it's interesting. Earlier today, David, I was on a, a, a discussion with former President uh, Clinton. And I remember in uh, the 90s with Clinton going to meetings with Yeltsin and sitting in the back of the room was this guy, Vladimir Putin. So I've had a long time to watch him, as you say. And I came to the conclusion also, as you say early, that he wasn't gonna turn out the way we wanted. And he hasn't. So this is a guy for whom thwarting us is an objective all by itself. And it's really hard to build a bridge to that mentality. Normally, if somebody has different interests from us, then we work together where we can, where our interests coincide and separate and, and against one another where they don't. But if you've got somebody who's one of his interests is thwarting you, a little hard to build a bridge to that motivation. That's Vladimir Putin. And the other thing is that unlike China, which is on the rise, Russia is by most measures uh, on the decline, demographic, economic, and so forth. And so you see him increasingly resorting to the tools of the weak, which are little green men, cyber, uh, gray warfare, as we call it, and of course, brandishing nuclear weapons. So you see all that stuff, and that's the toolkit of Vladimir Putin. And you need to push back 
on that. I do believe Vladimir Putin is a very realistic guy. He's, he's, he's extremely rational. You don't have to worry, wonder what the guy's thinking. He tells you. He's a very articulate uh, str strategically. And you've probably talked to him, David. And so you you know, you don't have to wonder. He's a he's a formidable diplomatic uh, 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 opponent, but he's not mysterious. And he does respond to counter push. And I, so I think it's important that you push back, not to start World War Three all the time, uh, but that you 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 continually push back. And he does respond to that and that keeping him pushed back on is about as good as it's going to get uh, with modern Russia. And I do think that is, you know, an achievable strategy for the United States. So I think I hear you suggesting that we need sometimes to use uh, some elements of the toolkit that Putin himself uses, things in that gray zone uh, that, that push him back, that show him that we're watching. Might have to do that, but you don't have to go back symmetrically. You just have to go back. So let me give you an example, David. A lot of people used to ask me all the time, still do, what if the United States is attacked by cyber? What do you do? And they're expecting an answer about cyber. And my answer always is, uh, if you attack my country, that's an attack. And the fact that you did it with cyber is not the main thing to me as your secretary of defense the main thing to me is that you've attacked my country and i may go after you in any way that i consider your soft underbelly and russia has its vulnerabilities and i want to go into them here but but when we thought about scenarios like this we didn't think about tit for tat we thought about pushing back in a way that would be palpable and effective and we do have ways of doing that let's turn to the other uh, great power uh, concern for this administration and and to be fair uh this was an area where the trump administration did some i, I think creative thinking and that's that's china um and, and i want to ask you uh for your assessment of the threat that this rising China, a, 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 a peer adversary, the likes of which we've never really faced in terms of its economic and technological power, how do you think we can best uh, deal with that China? Where where we should be pushing more? Where we should be seeking um, the possibility of, of of partnership? What's the Ash Carter uh, prescription for for China? Well, Xi Jinping also responds to push back, in my opinion, and it's dangerous not to push back. He just, his hubris accumulates like a snowball rolling downhill if you don't push back. And so one needs to do that, you know, at the same time talking to them. And here's the playbook, David, for uh, China. Uh, and, uh, you know, I came up in the Cold War, and so I fought Cold Wars. And, uh, and so we knew how to do that with a sustained ideological and military formidable competitor in the Soviet Union. Um, but it was much simpler because we didn't trade with them. <laughs> we, we built a, a, a plastic bag around the, the Warsaw Pact and said nothing can go in either direction. Trade, technology, nothing. And that was our strategy. That won't, well, that can't be a strategy for China. So what is a strategy for China? I think of it, David, and I don't mean this in a warlike way, but an offense and a defense. Uh, the defense, let me start with the defense. The defense is a thing that a lot of people talk about and that are necessary, but are not sufficient, like protections on whether they can invest here, uh, protections on whether they can steal intellectual property here, whether we protect intellectual property. Uh, and so forth. That's plain defense, good to do, but not sufficient. Offense is beating them, being better. And of course, as Secretary of Defense, it was important for me to do that technologically. And so I did a lot of things to make sure that we had the best technology in the military, but there's a lot more than that. Um, you asked, you, you, I think you questioned earlier on in the interview, 
whether China was going to, you know, was ahead of us. And here's my answer to that, David. It's not in comprehensive military power. It'll be some time before it is. Uh, that's not a complete consolation, but it's worth knowing why we still spend more than they do. And importantly, we have spent more than they have for a long time, which means we have a great accumulated capital stock in our military. Our military is experienced. Theirs is not. All that is for the good, but the big ingredient, David, and this is where I'm afraid we may have, again, lost a little ground recently, is that we have the friends and allies and they don't. That is of inestimable value in not just militarily, but morally, economically, and every other way. Uh, people always ask me what our China policy is. I, I say we don't we don't we ought to have a China policy. We should have an Asia policy. China's only half of Asia. And so let's get to the other half. And if we can't deal with China and can't trade with it freely and all that, let's at least be able to do that with the other half of Asia and with the other four fifths of planet Earth. So there's a lot out there. And this is the reason why I bothered me, quite honestly in recent years to be dissing our friends uh, because it, it, it's not having friends isn't something and it's just a favor for foreigners. It's a force multiplier to me. And so that's part of the offense is being better than them in every way, making sure we're putting money into technology, protecting our companies, getting good human capital, making it the best military in the world but also having friends. I want to turn in a moment to our, our uh, friends, our new uh, best uh, buddies um, uh, known as the Quad. But, but I want to ask you one more question uh, before we leave China specifically, uh, Ash. And that, that's the issue that I think uh, shadow the meeting uh, in uh, in Anchorage between uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, which is Taiwan. Yeah. There, there is a concern in the new administration, and I think among analysts generally, that Sh Xi Jinping feels that the moment of actual re reunification, not the fuzzy ambiguities uh, of 1972, the Shanghai Declaration, but re real un reunification is coming. And there's a concern that the United States' ability to deter that militarily um, has all but disappeared because of Chinese advances. And I'd like to ask you to, ad to address both. First, what you think is the Chinese ambition or threat to Taiwan? And second, um, wh whether you think we have the military power to contemplate military solutions if in this ambiguous state of our relationship with Taiwan, we decided we wanted to use them. Okay, well, let me start the first, the, the, the first part. Uh, it, they want Taiwan. They always have since 1949, they say they have. It's part of their destiny, it's part of their right. And our policy has all, always been, since Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, we're not gonna argue with you about that, but not now and not soon. So get off it and settle. And we've been able to persuade successive leaders, including Xi Jinping in the early days, that this wasn't, that this would ruin everything for them. And one of the ways you convince him that isn't just telling him is by constant pushback on other things. But this is a guy who, if he gets momentum up, will think that that is an achievable thing. I think that a Chinese invasion, which by the way is not what they do, um, but a Chinese attempt to take over Taiwan by force, um, uh, I believe would be, I'm certain, uh, very hazardous for them. Uh, as you, uh, I, think, I think we're saying, uh, we can't do it the old way because China is not as weak 
as it used to be. Um, so you wouldn't do it the old way. Um, at the same time, um, and as powerful as they are and near as Taiwan is, um, I, 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 I think it could be made, it would be made uh, a very ugly baby uh, for them. And you need to make sure that they know that. But the best way of doing that isn't to say, if you get up a big head of steam here and come up, we're going to do something that will really be bad for everybody. The The best way to, advert, to, to fend that off is to become and to continue to be very steadily uh, to have an offense and a defense that is steady and persistent and comprehensive. Xi Jinping does respond to that. He's got other fish to fry um, at home, politically and economically, and you can make those things loom larger uh, in comparison to uh, prematurely trying to make history go um, uh, his way. So I, I, I'm concerned about it, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I do think there are things we can do. And you got a team in there now, uh, Kurt Campbell, among others, whom you know very well, who are A plus uh, uh, people at this portfolio. And so I, 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 I think we can play our hand well. The, the, this is a, a strong uh, Asia team, uh, uh, starting with Kurt, they make your point, Ash, that we need a, an Asia policy and we should count our blessings for having uh, good allies. Um, I should note that in, in the meeting um, with Yang Jishu and the, the uh, other Chinese official, um, Secretary Blinken um, on Taiwan said China ought to consider the possibility that this is actually a success, that this potentially very explosive and dangerous issue has been managed by our two countries effectively now for what going on 50 years. And I thought it was a very interesting uh, comment. So I, I mentioned earlier that that uh, the Quad, the group of uh, Japan, uh, Australia, the United States, and, and fundamentally uh, for the future, India uh, is key now in Asia. And uh, we're lucky to have in our uh, audience, I believe, um, the ambassador from a country that may be part of the Quad Plus. You hear gossip that it may be expanded, and that's New Zealand. And uh, Ambassador Rosemary Banks is, is with us. And Ambassador, if you're here and would like to make a comment or a question, please go ahead. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Secretary Carter. It's been a, a fascinating sharing of your perspectives. Yes, I would like to pick up on the, the question of Quad. Well, for New Zealand, as you would know, Indo-Pacific is our region, and we very much welcome the presence of the US in the architecture across the region, and that's been primarily ASEAN. But yes, in recent times, there's been quite a lot of attention to Quad. Now, I know it's not a new organization. It goes back to 2004, I think. But it does seem in recent times to have taken on a new momentum. So I'd be interested in your thoughts, uh, Secretary, as to what the future trajectory of, of the Quad and even indeed the, uh, the future uh, role and perhaps extended membership of it might be. Thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Ambassador, and thanks for being here uh, today and for being another really great friend uh, of the United States uh, in every sphere, uh, including the moral one, which is important to me. Um, yeah, and the Quad is has been around for a while, for sure. Um, I worked on it. I participated in it. I think it's a good thing, um, and I hope it gets stronger. And the only thing I would say to you, Madam Ambassador, is it's not an exclusive uh, uh, international grouping. We have, you mentioned ASEAN, we have bilateral alliances, important ones. Uh, we have important intelligence relationships that involve different groupings, which you're probably, I'm certain you're, you're familiar with. Um, 
And the, so the United States participates, and I hope will continue to, a number of groupings in the Asia Pacific. And some of those are determined by history, some of them by chance, uh, some of them by uh, whoever happened to get there uh, at the beginning. But what's critical to, to all of us, I think, in view of what we've been saying about China, is that we remain a network of countries that work together closely in the security and other areas um, because China, China's approach is to work bilaterally and pick off countries one by one, companies one by one, which they can do because they can bring military, economic, political power all to bear at once because they're a dictatorship. And our societies can't match that. And our strength is working together multilaterally. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I, will the quad expand? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm all for that actually uh, myself, but I don't think that uh, your own country uh, is or should or feel should feel uh, excluded. It's not certainly from my perspective, but I think more importantly from any perspective I've ever seen in the United States. Uh, people want to see four countries work better uh, together. That's a good thing also for New Zealand, but it doesn't mean that anybody's um, uh, excluded. Ash, uh, with thanks to Ambassador Banks for that terrific question, I want to ask you to stay with the, the Quad for a moment mm -hmm. and to speak a little bit about the country that with the United States is the strategic heart of this uh, partnership, uh, and that's India. India has been a wonderful friend uh, and increasingly ally of the United States. But it's a complicated friend and ally. Yeah. Uh, it's a country that has a sometimes autarkic economic policy, uh, works hard to protect uh, its own um, industries uh, in ways that sometimes are difficult for, for US officials. Uh, it's a country that has complicated longstanding relationships with, with Russia, uh, complicated uh, in recent uh, times, uh, outright dangerous relationship with, with China. Uh, but, but I want to ask whether you feel going forward that we can have a deepening partnership with India that extends uh, powerfully to the military and security sphere. I, I do. I think it's, in fact, uh, David destined to occur because there's just too much in common between us in interests, in functioning. I'll give you an example. Uh, last conversation I had with um, Modi uh, when I was in office, uh, he and I were reflecting on something that wasn't germane to everything particular that we were discussing, but I was remarking to him how many Indian and Indian American entrepreneurs there were in the tech world in the United States. And I said, there's something um, uh, 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 kindred about mentalities there. Uh, it's not just the English language. Uh, it's more than that. And um, so I, and I think two large democracies, which on their good days share really good values, um, I, I think they're destined. Now, at the same time, I always tell myself and uh, people who work for me, um, when you go see someone, before you go, book up on their history, and because that's where they're coming from. And um, so when you look back at the history of India, you find, David, you all know this, but first of all, the non-aligned tradition which said, which is, is goes deeply and says, uh, you know, you've got to be ready to take care of yourself. So don't get too dependent on your relations with any other country. That's changing over the decades, but it's still there. Uh, and second uh, is their links to Russia. 
which we had to think about as a military because a lot of Indian equipment is Russian and they still, they can't just, you know, throw it all out and start all over. Can't afford to do that. And so they're going to keep working with the Russians. And that's part of their history also. Uh, and those two things and other, other things will mean that it'll go uh, steadily, but at its own pace. Uh, but I think it's destiny. Uh, and I think it's it's a huge thing for both of our countries. Um, and I, I always did everything I could to accelerate the pace, but I was also realistic because people are coming from where people are coming from. So that's one of my takeaways from our session today is the intensity with which Ash Carter said destiny when he talked about the U.S.-India relationship. I want to turn to another uh, distinguished uh, guest who's, who's with us, uh, and that's Vivek Lal, who's the chief executive of General Atomics uh, Global Corporation. And uh, Vivek, if you're here, um, either by uh, uh, telephone or, or, or by uh, uh, Teams, please, uh, if you have a question or comment for Secretary Carter, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, good afternoon, Secretary Carter, and it's an honor to hear you you and your thoughts uh, there. I uh, had a question for you. Um, given the limited U.S. basing options and large distances of the Western Pacific, how can the United States create a significant deterrent presence, including ISR collection, in the Western Pacific, in your opinion? Yeah, that's a good question, Vivek, and it's a huge, huge area of operations. If you think about militarily, which you know how to do. By the way, let me thank you for General Atomics. You know, we don't make anything in the Pentagon, so we count on uh, defense uh, uh, companies. And I've had, uh, yeah, I was the acquisition czar at one time, so we we had. Uh, uh, you know, good relationship. Sometimes, you know, it's a business relationship. So, so uh, right. sometimes tough negotiations. But I was always grateful for what you guys uh, uh, did. So I understand. I appreciate that. Um, listen, uh, Vivek, you're right. And here's uh, the the answer. Uh, we do need to span that distance, and um, we're not going to be able to operate if we're talking about China now up against China the way we used to. Uh, we understand that. That's unrealistic. Um, so you do have to go to longer distances. I'll give you two ways among many that you do that. Uh, one is by having longer legged aircraft for ISR, and that is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, uh, which we are making and you help us make in some cases um, in order to specifically to span that distance in recognition of the fact that many are in our country have now belatedly, uh, unfortunately, but anyway, finally come to the view that the Chinese aren't turning out the way we wanted back in the 90s and we've got to protect ourselves. Uh, another way you do it is our bomber, the B-21 bomber, which I started, but Secretary Gates was Secretary of Defense at the time, long range bomber. That's not a blast from the past. It's going to be part of this future. But the big thing, Vivek, is friends right. and allies in the region. Uh, that's the big way that we maintain a uh, America as a palpable uh, Pacific uh, power. And um, that's why I was in favor of things like TPP. That's not going to happen. Okay. Um, but uh, why the things we were talking about with uh, our, our ambassador from New Zealand are so important uh, because one of the things that spans those distances is friends and allies. So thank you. Sir. Thank you. For that uh, uh, question, uh, Vivek, which uh, is, is is a fascinating one, and, and for Secretary Carter's answer, um, I'm going to begin to turn to audience questions, and I want to remind everybody in the audience that if you'd like to ask a question, uh, go to the uh, Q&A function at the top of your screen, 
and to type in uh, uh, the question and it will come to us and we'll process uh, those and uh, use as many as we can. I want to start with a question that's anonymous, but is pretty darn interesting. Um, Ash, the questioner writes, America's moral influence around the world may be at its low point since the Vietnam War. What do we need to do to reestablish moral leadership? Well, it's a good question, and I I'm I understand where the question comes from, and it saddens me that it's there, and I I I I I can't absolutely contest it. I, I will say this, David. Uh, I you know I hope we can get whatever we've lost back. Um, it, it's it's hard because reputation is one of those things that's you know very hard to get back. The other thing is most of our friends are, are democracies, and when you disrespect the people of a democracy, you create a lasting problem. Uh, you know, with Kim Jong Un, you can say whatever you want, and tomorrow, if he changes his mind, it's just tell his people he changed his mind, and that'll be the end of it. But you can't do that with Angela Merkel, Merkel, uh, because uh, you know she she can't turn on a dime if her population uh, won't. Uh, to me, values matter uh, a lot in in, in foreign affairs, uh, uh, David. And ours are the Enlightenment values. And if you remember the phrase of the Enlightenment days, as an historian. Uh, they talked about the dignity of man in those days. We would say the dignity of people today. And so China, for example, has another system. And I would say it is about being Chinese, not about being human. And it's not to say they're inhuman. I just mean their political values are, are you have to be Chinese to get started. Uh, and <laughs> That, that doesn't make much of a world philosophy. So I think we have to stick up for our values uh, and live our values. And, you know, I, I, I hope that we, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, regain some of the reputation that the questioner uh, 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 states we've we've lost. I hope we can we can uh, get that back. You know, it help. It uh, actually helps uh, to to have a guy like Joe Biden, if I can say so, just because he is so palpably a decent guy, um, and that matters for something uh, in in the world. And you, this is your former Secretary of Defense talking, um, and but soft things matter. Here's a question that um, goes to the complicated nature of working with allies uh, the, who have their own interests. The questioner asks, how does Europe's uneven approach to China, and that's putting it uh, charitably, uh, complicate the drive to work with these allies? What do you think about that, uh, Ash? Uh, David, do you mean to work with our Asian allies, working with our European no, allies? No, I think the the question was, as, as Europe yeah. seeks to position itself relative to China, um, how does that complicate our dealings with our, our, our NATO partners? Um, uh, and, you know, and are the Chinese, in effect, taking advantage of us by playing our allies off against us? Yeah, well, they are. And as I said, that's their best uh, tactic, uh, right, is to pick people off. Our best tactic is to get everybody working together who's, so to speak, on our side. Uh, and that means um, uh, not uh, uh, keeping Europe a uh, strategically aligned with the United States is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm I certainly favor uh, the NATO uh, alliance. And what that what you can't do, David, I'll just hasten to say, I've been talking about two sides, and I'm doing that a little too loosely, because most countries don't want to choose between the United States and China. 
they're happy to choose between values and systems uh, and which one they're more comfortable being part of and trading in and how they hope the world works as a economic and political unit. Uh, but they don't want to pick uh, between us. And if we if we force them into that mentality, uh, that's that's playing the Chinese hand, not the American hand. So let me just interpose a quick uh, follow on to that question. Do you think um, that the United States should be asking European countries and countries around the world to 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 pick? Uh, either you go with with Huawei and you're on our team, or uh, excuse me, you, you reject Huawei and you're on our team, or you go with Huawei and you you drift toward the Chinese t team. Are we right to make a sharp division on that question? Well, we are in that case on 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 Huawei, uh, but not across the board. You're not going to get. Uh, to, I, you, you're not going to start a Soviet style Cold War where everybody stops trading with China. But where the technological relationship is disadvantageous, uh, then, uh, you know, ultimately it's their decision. And shame on us, by the way, for not having our own Huawei that does the things that we don't like. But, um, it's fine if Huawei wants to sell us handsets, phones, on a competitive basis. Uh, 5G infrastructure is a different matter. And the reason it's a different matter for us and our friends and allies and why it's worth warning them about is it's a good vehicle to position them either to spy or to sabotage a critical infrastructure of ours. And, you, you know, you don't do that. Uh, 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 to yourself. And so so I, I would say you have to go into Huawei and look at its piece parts. Should we sell chips to them for their handset? Should we buy handsets from them? And that's going to be life with China, David. Um, uh, and, and, and that's not our choice. Xi Jinping has said he wants to be autonomous in many areas of technology. That's called splinter net. There are going to be areas where that is going to happen. Uh, I don't. I that that should not. I hope happen across the economic board. That would be bad for everyone. But it will happen um, either because we do it to protect ourselves and our friends do it to protect themselves, or uh, because China insists on it, which it does all the time. It excludes American companies and products. It picks off one company and gives it an advantage over the other. It routinely does things that are not our way of doing business. And, um, you know, you can't stop them from doing that, but you, you got to protect yourself uh, and your own economic uh, way of life. Here are two good uh, questions about money, and I'm going to group them together. Uh, they're different, but maybe you could take them uh, in turn. First, from Peter Coy, he asks the fundamental question, does the defense budget need to grow? And the second question is from an anonymous uh, uh, participant. How important is it to invest and guarantee technological leadership on semiconductors and, and artificial intelligence to keep the U.S. role as world leader. Great, both and re, re, related uh, questions in one sense, which I'll try to tease out. Look, the defense, but I'm realistic as as a as Secretary of Defense. It was always easier for me if the defense budget went out went up. Um, it never did, mostly because in those days we were worried about budget deficits and we and that seems antique now, but that was the reigning ideology of the time, if you'll remember, David. And people basically during most of the last decade wouldn't give us any more more money. But that didn't make me feel that we were doomed um, because we don't spend every dollar in the best possible way. That's true also. And um, uh, Peter, I, I was the acquisition executive, then I was the deputy, the COO of the Pentagon before I became the CEO. 
And so I had plenty of opportunity to see, and I believe plenty of opportunity to make us more um, uh, uh, parsimonious with a taxpayer uh, dollar. You do that with technology, you do it with training your people to be smart business people um, and, and lots of other ways. So I think it's not, it doesn't look like it's in the cards that the budget, defense budget is going to grow. And I would look, if I were Lloyd's position, Lloyd Austin, our excellent Secretary of Defense, and I think he probably thinks like this, although I can't speak for him, but 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 um, if he's not going to have more money, he's going to spend his money better. And that may sound trite, but man, it's possible uh, in the Department of Defense. And it's related to the point about semiconductors and AI, uh, the second questioner. You're right. Uh, they are key technologies. They are key technologies where uh, we have an historic lead, a lead that's important to economic security and national security. And um, how do you keep it? And that's where we come back again and again to uh, the new playbook for the new Cold War, uh, which has a, an offense and a defense, as I said, and you're not going to defend your way. You know, you're not going to retard China's advance. And that can't be your only strategy. You have to be good ourselves. And that's why I'm in favor. There was a, recently a national AI uh, com, uh, 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 committee uh, formed that reported out that had ex, uh, Eric Schmidt, a great guy, and Bob Work as their chairs. And they said, we need to spend more uh, in this area. So the country has to invest in itself to remain the best. And you, put your finger on two fields where you can't just play defense. You got to play offense, by which I mean running faster than the other guy, not just trying to slow the other guy down. Here's an interesting uh, question about a subject that we don't talk enough about in the national security context, and that's climate change. And this is from uh, a friend at the French embassy who says, I'm interested in the threats that climate change may pose, both safety and actual military risks to the U.S., and, and what policies can be implemented here and with allies in the EU and elsewhere to mitigate these um, hard national security con con consequences of a world uh, where climate change and, and attendant changes in the environment uh, may have significant uh, effect? Uh, well, the, the questioner is absolutely right. There are security consequences of climate change. Um, I, I, I don't consider them the first order changes of, of concern, quite honestly, David. Uh, I think there's so many economic and social things that are happening and people who live in Alaska already say, uh, you know, we'll tell you it's palpable. So this isn't something that's theoretical anymore. I'm a physicist. I believe in the greenhouse effect. Uh, it's not made up. It's not a hoax. It's real. And I don't think that we're going to turn it around soon. I think we can turn it around, but it's going to have a real effect. And you got to be realistic in the Defense Department. That'll mean that a lot of societies will come under more pressure than they otherwise would. And that'll have, you know, repercussions for security. There'll be specific things like changes in the Arctic for navigation, um, uh, disappearing atolls in the, in the Asia Pacific, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they don't rise to the what I used to call cricket, China, Russia, Iran, Korea, terrorism level of immediacy and palpability. But uh, they're 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 important. Um, uh, I, I, I don't see large specific investments. Uh, at this time that we need to take in, in, in defense. And I, I'm always, this may sound parochial or whatever, something narrow-minded or something, but, but and I, I, I'm sorry if it does, but as Secretary of Defense, I'm always 
cautious when people try to say, and I'm, this is not what the questioner is saying, this is other people, try to paint what is fundamentally a non-defense problem as a defense problem, because I think it is dilutive to our mission. Um, and so it, 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 I'm cautious about that. I don't know how to invest a whole lot in this compared to how I know how to invest in, let's say, um, greener uh, energy technologies. I know how to do that. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to spend a great deal of money protecting ourselves from climate change as a military matter. There are a lot of things we have to do to protect ourselves, but add to the defense budget or change the defense budget isn't one of them in my judgment. I would note we, we're past uh, five o'clock. We have a hard stop at 515. With Secretary Carter's permission, I'm going to ask a couple more questions okay. uh, before we before we leave all, all of you. We have a question that goes to what um, I would say is uh, perhaps the greatest threat of all to our national security, broadly defined, and that is the degree of internal division in our democracy and the resulting weakness. Uh, here's how the questioner uh, puts it. How can the Biden administration restore the credibility of its long-term commitments in Asia when the Trump administration demonstrated how much can change with the outcome of a presidential election, especially since <laughs> nearly half the members of Congress and most Republicans still refuse to declare that President Biden won the 2020 election. Ash, what do we do about a country where so many of our citizens still seem to buy this idea that our last election was a hoax, fraud? Uh, yeah, I, you know, a couple observations on that. I mean, first of all, it, it takes us a little out of the defense lane here, but I'll say it anyway, because I'm a citizen with his eyes open, been around Washington a long time. Um, uh, it, it is a shame. I've never seen it before in my time alive and dealing with Washington, particularly since it wasn't actually all that close uh, and an election in, in historical uh, uh, terms. Um, but it is what it is. And you got to play the game that's on the field. My view or my outlook toward this is that we are not intrinsically a divided country. We have been divided. Um, and that's different. Uh, that is been divided is a politics which goes the road, the low road of teaching other people to feel aggrieved about teaching people to feel aggrieved about other people rather than showing them the way to a better life. Uh, and uh, it's a easily available form of politics. It's been used uh, successfully. I saw it in the Balkans, by the way, with a vengeance. David, you'll remember this in the 1990s. <clears throat> but it's a good question for 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 our international partners: is how can we trust you guys when you zig and you zag? Um, and uh, uh, there's no good answer to that except to say that uh, uh, it's important when you're making policy, and I hope the current administration is able to do this, to try to um, uh, make it as solid a reflection of the views of many Americans as you possibly can. Uh, that, you know, uh, that's hard work um, and uh, you can be thwarted by people who want to kind of demagogue a foreign policy issue and so forth. Uh, so you have to be patient. You have to be persuasive. I really do believe, and I don't want to sound Pollyannish here, but I think that, um, you know, logic really does, is still pa very powerful. And if you explain and persuade and, and that why something is right, and you really are right, uh, and you can get that across. You can make it 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 stick. Um, so 
I, I know that doesn't make us automatically credible. Only time will. Um, and I hope that we're given that time and that we use it well. Uh, but I think it is possible. And I think it, it kind of deprecates our own people to say they're divided in, in a kind of senseless way. I, uh, I think they're better than that. They've been divided. And, uh, you know, the political way forward, I hope, is uh, a less divided, divided one. Well, we'll we'll take that as as our as our hope and guide for the future. Um, I'm going to uh, close, uh, uh, Ash, with a question of my own. It's one that I've been waiting to ask you for a, a few days, and so I'm going to uh, be selfish and grab the last couple minutes to ask it. Uh, and my question is, what about space? Uh, in the context of defense and national security. Do you think the creation of the Space Force was a good idea? Should it survive? And, you know, obviously within that question is whether the Air Force dropped the ball on space uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, leading to the congressional um, uh, criticism that really lay behind the creation of the Space Force. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think I think that was that was it. It was a doubt that the Air Force would do um, what was necessary, which was to um, it, I'm going to use my words now, integrate space into military operations. Uh, and I was for that, too. By the way, it's a totally different thing, but I would not have picked the Space Force path to do that, David. That's not my wouldn't have been my managerial. I'm speaking now as a manager of the Defense Department. That wouldn't be my particular solution to this problem. But it's done now. And I think that's fine. I wouldn't undo it. Um, but what it's but I would try to use the best impulses under which it was created, which was to strengthen the, the integration of space into military operations. So let me give you an example. Uh, you have a war plan, let us say, and on day such and such, I can't go into specifics, but you know how these things work. It'll tell you how many tankers are in the air, how many fighters are in the air, where various ships are, and so these are the kind of things that plans are filled with, right? Um, for a long time, it didn't tell you what much of what was going on in space. Uh, what you were going to do with space, what if the things that you were counting on from space weren't there all of a sudden? What are you going to do then? And so we need, it's, it's important enough, uh, even though everything we do in space is just a support function, remember. It's communications, navigation, geodetic measurements, surveillance. And there's no warfare to, so to speak, up there per se. Up there, it's it's these are military support functions, but they're important support functions, and um, so I think it, they had to be integrated. You know, I started way back. 1980 was my first job uh, in the Pentagon, and space was a you know exotic intelligence thing. Uh, lots of code words and stuff, and other than communication satellites. A lot of it was secret, secret, secret. And um, that by itself stops it from being mixed in with everything else. Um, so I think integration is a good thing. That is the purpose of Space Force, and I think it can live up to that purpose. And that, 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 that's a good thing. So I, th I think it's OK. You can rewrite history and say, well, if the Air Force had done it, maybe when we necessarily have a separate force, well, OK, true. Do I, did I have a better way of doing it? Well, yeah, I think I did, but so what? It doesn't matter at this point. There is a space force. It's going to do us, I think, net good in just this way of integration. Great answer. And I want to thank um, my friend, uh, Secretary Ash Carter, for uh, this wonderful discussion of a broad range of national security issues and uh, turn this back to our host at the Chamber, the Senior Vice President for European Affairs, Marjorie Turland.
David, thanks so much. And I really want to extend uh, tremendous gratitude to both you and the secretary for that tremendous tour of the horizon, uh, touching on some of the most pressing challenges uh, and opportunities that we face today. So really grateful for your time. Really appreciate the audience's terrific questions. Um, and I, um, I know I would love to continue the conversation, but um, but I know we're out of time. I just wanted to take a moment at the end here uh, to uh, mention two things upcoming. First, uh, our next instep conversation will be uh, with the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and I would like to personally extend my thanks to Ambassador Banks for her help uh, in organizing that. Uh, details will follow in terms of signing up. I know it'll be an interesting conversation, um, and I suspect we'll, we'll be delving a little bit into the quad conversation again. The other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, as, we, as we look at emerging from the pandemic, one of the things that it's highlighted is the need for uh, strong U.S. leadership on the international stage to reinvigorate growth and strengthen supply chains and strengthen trade uh, to support a global recovery. So American leadership in investing in our own competitiveness and partnering uh, with our allies is extraordinarily important. So with that in mind, next month, uh, the chamber will host its first ever um, global forum on economic recovery. Uh, it'll be hosted, uh, led by our CEO, Suzanne Clark. Details will follow on that. Uh, but I anticipate that it will be uh, a very interesting combination of uh, ideas and thoughts about how we can partner to advance the global recovery. And with that, uh, and with a, a heartfelt thanks uh, to uh, Secretary Carter and to David Ignatius, uh, I bid you all good evening.